Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our webinar this evening. Um, our topic for this evening is engaging contemporary culture. So for tonight, we are going to talk about what are the challenges, what is the pathway that as a Christian we face and how we might live our Christian life well. Okay, um, our brother Jose is from Chennai. He grew up in India and he completed both his Master of Divinity and Master of Theology at the same time from Singapore Bible College in 20, 2008. He also has a Master in Science from Loyola College and he's currently pursuing his PhD in Intercultural Study from Ashbury Theological Seminary in um, USA. He also lectures in Bible schools and seminaries in Southeast Asia region. Our brother Jules has been active in Christian ministry for over a decade in Southeast Asia, and he served as an apologist, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And with his master's degree in science and theology, he has a keen interest in philosophy and culture, and a passion for engaging people across culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, his focus has been mainly on building gospel-shaped communities across this region. And now, without further ado, we just want to welcome our speaker for tonight, our brother, Jos. Okay, I pass the time to you. Thank you, Hayen, and uh, I'm hoping that you could uh, see me and just give me a second. So I'm hoping that uh, you would be able to see my screen that I'm sharing, and uh, you know, I'm going to keep the chat box open as well so in case there is a problem with you seeing the screen uh, i will know i mean unfortunately i'm not able to see y'all i would have really loved to have seen y'all and interacted with you uh, doing this uh, you know at least by having a site uh, but that's not going to be the case here new ways right of how we are engaging like as uh Hayen was mentioning i'm in the u.s now so it's uh a little early in the morning for me uh, it's uh, barely cracking seven and uh, well that's not so much the problem as it is just about under well it's minus four degrees so just about under zero degrees over here and uh, don't let you know the lack of jackets and sweaters fool you I'm sitting in a in a controlled heated room so I, I hope the the heater won't die on me but anyway, I'm glad to be here and glad to be bringing to you some thoughts on how we engage culture, uh, you know, some reflections on the contemporary challenges and pathways. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make a few assumptions and some of the assumptions I'm going to make are very simple and straightforward. I'm going to assume that we are interacting as a group of people who understand that uh, we live in a Christian mandate, right? The mandate being what comes to us from Jesus, which is you are salt of the earth, you are light of the world. This is this is what Jesus uh, tells us that we are. So we're going to take that mandate for granted. And then uh, we're making another assumption, which is that we know our faith in many ways must speak into culture. And so the question we are asking is, uh, what is the the means of doing that now there are some fundamental questions that arise from this we know that christians are meant to be salt and light in other words if you use those as metaphors we know that christians are meant to be people who preserve truth in a culture that is loaded with lies and every way uh, you see sometimes it's more valuable to lie through a situation at least that's how it's perceived then bear the burden of truth in that context so we're called to preserve truth and of course uh, the darkness that comes with lies uh, the way that people are misled and so on and so forth so we are not only called to preserve truth but we're also called to expose uh, lies and expel darkness dispelling it and so on and so forth so we in one sense we understand that this is what we need to do as people of faith as followers of Jesus Christ so the question is 
how does this work itself out? Because it's not only that we understand that we are tall, called to be salt of the earth and light of the world. We also pray, you know, when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we do this. We, we know that we're supposed to be salt and light. We pray that his kingdom come and his will be done on earth. We, we also, in that sense, know that we're called to look at the world with eyes of faith. Jesus, uh, you know, in John 4, he says to his disciples, you say that there are a few more months to go before the harvest, but I say, look, the harvest is ready. So we're called to look at the world with eyes of faith, recognizing that the harvest is not just ready, but it's plentiful. But then we also, in one sense, need to appreciate, we need to realize our predicament. I mean, Jesus himself says that, well, the harvest is ready, it's plentiful, but the laborers are few. And we are meant to nurture an expectations where, in faith, we believe that the Lord will send laborers. And that is where I believe we have a problem. We have a predicament. It's, it's what I call that we are faced with a conundrum. And sometimes it's all too common. We are faced with a problem and sometimes it's all too common. And, and, and here is where I think uh, we see the struggles really come to uh, a front over here and 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 challenge us because we all very often when we talk about this with with one another we know that we are meant to participate right in in the world and things so the voice of the church is meant to be a part of conversations in the public space the christian is meant to be a christian everywhere not just in church and not just on a sunday and now well, not just when we gather together in Zoom meetings for such purposes. We're meant to be who we are in every space. And there's good reason why we struggle with that. Because if you took a closer look at what's happening in the world today, uh, you will be struck with two realities. And I want you to think about both of this very, very carefully. On, on one end, it's the reality of what I call progress. All right. We're getting better and better at what we do. Progress. Think about what, how we were using technology, uh, not in terms of technology, in terms of its progress, but the common person, how you and I as individuals are using technology about 18 months ago and how we're using technology now. The amount of time we spend on, on screens and using technology. I mean, there's progress, right? So on one end, this this is one side of the reality. We're getting better and better at what we do. But then, on the other side, is also the reality of regress. It's not only the reality of progress that we're facing, we are also encountering the reality of regress, which means we are rapidly losing a sense of who we are and why we do what we do. Progress on one side, regress on the other and the troubling fact is most christians are you know they kind of turn a blind eye to this interaction between progress and regress we assume that as long as we are progressing it's fine it doesn't matter about what else is happening and that's why i think many christians are reluctant to intersect their faith with how they live so it raises the question of where are the ones who are saying, here I am, Lord, send me. It raises a serious question for us. And so we step back and we ask, what is the relationship between the Christian and the culture? Now, let me just tell you how I'm using the word culture so you understand where we're going with it. You know. A very, very common understanding of the word culture is that it's a it's a shared set of beliefs or customs or, you know, it's how a community or a society uh, attributes value and how it lives life together, what it pursues. It, it's, it's a particular place, you know, I mean, it's, it's got a lot of elements to, in it. It could be uh, behavior, it could be food, it could be all of this. It's basically like a, a, a tapestry of different strands that come together, forming a fabric in which we live our lives including our beliefs and our customs and our food habits and our language and 
our dress and our habits and our aspirations, all of that. It's, it's a shared way of life. So the question is, if this is what culture is, how must Christians speak into this culture? Now, is it necessary we do it all the time? Or is it only something we do when things are going bad? In other words, is it a normal way of how we live our lives that we constantly think about everything? I mean, think, for example, uh, must we give thanks for the food we eat anytime, any, any place uh, with anybody? Or is it only something that you do on special occasions? Uh, and if there's a, a difference between the two, and if you're in the company of those who don't really know why this is happening, do we share the burden of explaining it or do we just say, you know, if you don't mind, can I just, you know, close my eyes for two seconds and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue eating? Is, is it as simple and normal and common as that? Or is it something that we start engaging only when things are falling apart? When you take the vaccine, is it going to be the mark of the devil? Something like that. You know, is it is it is it? A normal way of life that we engage with culture or is it a crisis response that we do it only when things are falling apart that's that's one question that we ask but then it's not just how must faith speak into culture who does the speaking all right do you get experts to come and give you their views and then decide that this is what you will do or is this what every believer is meant to interact with and then it goes even even deeper than that what shapes or what determines the manner in which this speaking into culture so to speak happens is it is it something that we do because that's the way we express our Christian life and our faith in every sense of the word in other words it's the normal way of of our life or is it something that we will decide based on circumstances now all of these questions come together and remember at the backdrop of these questions is Jesus's declaration saying you are salt of the earth you are light of the world right? and and so we have to ask what is the relationship between Christian and culture you know one of my favorite reminders of how important this is it comes from uh, Dallas Willard in his book divine conspiracy I mean I probably use this analogy uh, many many times and because it's so poignant it's so powerful in what it says you know in, in his book divine conspiracy he talks about a, a trainee pilot who is practicing um, flying um, the fighter jets and so this this pilot she was doing all the routine you know flight moves you know very very high speed maneuvers and all of that in the fighter jet and what Dallas Willard says is that suddenly and unfortunately she comes crashing to her own death now what 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 happened it turns out that her controls were malfunctioning there was a malfunction on a control panel she thought she was going for a steep climb that's what she thought when she looked at her control but actual fact she was going exactly in the opposite direction she was headed to the ground and before anyone could say anything or she could realize what was happening she crashed and died she was unaware so Dallas that she was flying upside down and here's a problem now, the problem is this progress in the wrong direction is more than regress it can be very very dangerous and so I want to say to us this as a caution, even as I begin unpacking some of the means by which or some of the things we need to grapple with as we pursue engaging culture, irrespective of what we see the problem to be. I want to remind us that we will be worse off tomorrow than we are today if we don't know who we are. We lose sight of who we are and we continue to perfect what we do I want to think about it. there's a correlation between who we are and how we live and so if we lose sight of who we are and we continue doing what we do 
we will be in one sense progressing in doing what we do better but we would be regressing in living the life we are called to live and the world will be spiraling out of control including us who are meant to be salt and light because it is our mandate as salt and light to dispel darkness and preserve truth and so the need is great and the mandate is clear and yet unfortunately uh, what Jesus said in John 4 remains to be the case where the harvest is plenty but the laborers are few and so the question is why might this be the case why is it that the laborers are few may I suggest three things that we are called to grapple with as as we engage with culture and these three things are what I would say things we will recognize when we introspect when we look inward what is it that we see and those three ideas that I want us to grapple with are, are dull eyes dense hearts and deaf ears we struggle with engaging culture as we must is because our eyes are dull our hearts are dense and our ears are deaf what do I mean by dull eyes I, I mean we have regressed in capturing the vision we we caught a glimpse of it when we became followers of Jesus but as we progressed we have lost sight of it and now it's not only a distant thing in terms of our sight but it has disappeared in the you know in the rearview mirror I believe that as a community we're struggling with keeping our calling front and center we have lost what I would say the vision of how Christian living is at the heart of human flourishing and you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you've thought about this when someone uh, asks you why they are a Christian if you've ever told them I follow Jesus so you can enjoy your life have you ever thought about it that way I follow Jesus so you can have a good life I mean that's what you would see in in Paul's uh, reflection on redemption when he talks about the new creation in Romans when he says all of creation groans for redemption at the revelation of the sons and daughters of God of the children of God in other words creation will rejoice when people start following Jesus closely have we lost a sense that Christian living is at the heart of human flourishing the gospel in that sense is more about us following Jesus for their sake and Jesus would say this in John 20 verse 21 as the father sent me I send you into the world now why did God send Jesus into the world so that the world would not perish have we lost a sense of our vision of what it means to be Christian and I would think uh, I would argue that well there seems to be a case for that dull eyes there's not only dull eyes but there's a sense of a dense heart as well and what I mean by that is there's a passion misplaced the, the faithful followers of Jesus the church it seems has lost her heart courage and compassion to trust Jesus courage and to live for the good of the other compassion we lose sight that our faith is about uh, has in, in a lot uh, for a large extent has to do with living for the good of the other we lose sight of that dull eyes that translates with a lost passion where we lose a heart for the other we don't have compassion anymore and and when we do muster some sense of compassion we don't have the courage it takes courage to trust Jesus compassion to reach the lost so it seems that we are floundering there possibly because of our dense hearts and then of course deaf ears deaf ears and by that I mean that 
we have lost a sense of picking up the burdens the Lord wants us to carry the purpose for which we are you know called to live our lives you know we are always kind of it's like sound waves that are going by our eardrums very very rarely do they hit a strike a chord hit a nerve as it were and very rarely are we able to grapple with that so has the church in that sense lost her place in the gospel in being and sharing the good news and I'll, I'll, I'll reflect more about this when I talk about the unfortunate regress but here are the three things that I think we need to grapple with as we look inward dull eyes dense hearts and deaf ears and I think uh, we would be quick to appreciate this as the broader scheme of things as to how we are living in our community today uh, and that's easy to understand What's difficult to not just understand but appreciate is the fact that we have a significant role to play in why the faith community is the way it is. And it's possible that our eyes are dull, our hearts are dense, and our ears are deaf, which means, here's the thing, when the church work walks blindfolded, the world will trip and fall. I've had more people tell me, especially in the university settings, I mean, it's been a, over a year since I've had the privilege of being in a university setting and engaging with people, you know, sitting across from them in the student center or in the cafeteria, having a cup of coffee and, and chatting with them. Uh, I, I really wish uh, I could do that. Um, I hope I'll find the opportunity at the time to do it again soon. but. It's very rarely I've had a conversation with students where s some of them or at least one of them has not turned around and said the reason why they're not really interested in the Christian faith or, or Jesus Christ is because of what they see in the lives of their friends who are Christians. Some say they are hypocrites, others say there is no difference and, and a lot of them says it's a total waste of time. When the church walks blindfolded, the world will trip and fall and so it is it is imperative on our part that we do make the effort to care for what's happening around us we do take time to wait on the Lord and prepare to live as Paul would say ambassadors as ambassadors because we are new creation because we understand that God has reconciled us to him and because we appreciate that he's entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation we as Paul would say when he writes to the church in Corinthians uh, in Corinth 2nd Corinthians 5 we implore you implore plead that the world be reconciled with Christ because otherwise the world is making these high-speed maneuvers as it were without realizing the controls are malfunctioning and it's flying upside down plummeting to its own death so it's important that we take what blinds us and throw it away and we walk in this case in the light of what we know is true and help the world as it it engages us so Remember I said I will talk about the unfortunate regress. So the unfortunate regress is very simply this. Is the salt of the earth at risk of losing its saltiness? Is the salt of the earth at risk of losing its saltiness? Three things again. I'd like you to consider as I unpack this for you. I want us to think about the lies we have come to affirm for ourselves, which is what I call the symptoms of or why we are in this mess the lies we have come to affirm then we look at what underlies what or what forms the foundation of these lies we've come to affirm which is the cause that underlies the symptoms and what is the problem if we continue living this way the consequences the symptoms the causes the consequences the lies we've come to affirm what underlies the lies that we've come to affirm and the problems that we're going to face the consequences because of this so the symptoms the causes and the consequences what are the symptoms 
what are the lies we have come to affirm now let, let me say this i know i'm talking to a group of christians but it's, is it possible that we are practical deists now what is deism deism is a worldview which says of course we believe in a god there is a god he's created the world but this god is disconnected from the world he's not involved in the everyday affairs of the world i mean yeah, he's, he's out there, created the world, gone. Now we are, we just need to live our lives the way we are called to live. Now I'm not saying you believe in deism, but it's quite possible we live as deists because very often we see our faith as non-consequential to most of how we live our life. In other words, we sometimes tend to think our faith is limited to the spectacular and has very little to do with the ordinary practical deism now along with practical deism comes what i call practical dualism you know like i said we believe that god is involved in the spectacular we're always looking for the next big wonderful thing for god to do not really interested in the sm small things of life i mean come on we cross the road every day right well in this case we turn on zoom every other evening right big deal and so what's happening is that our tolerance for what I call the sacred secular divide increases. Increasingly, our lives get polarized. As practical deists, we become practicing dualists. The gap between what we call sacred and what we call secular just keeps increasing which leads us to an even greater problem again these are all symptoms right which is what i call practical atheism we theoretically believe that god is but we practically live especially in the public space as though it doesn't exist if we increase this gap between the sacred and the secular and we tend to believe that god is a god of the supernatural and the spectacular and very little to do with the natural and the ordinary the gap increases and we spend more time in this side living as practical atheists those are the symptoms practical deism practical dualism practical atheism but why what what underlies these things what are the causes what are the lies we have believed and come to come therefore have come to live the way we live i think the lies we have believed have a lot to do with the gospel that's misunderstood and therefore misappropriated now if i look at my own life i think a lot of time i've i think of the gospel primarily to do with what i believe my personal life my private life and therefore i'm happy to be a lot more open about god to god when i'm on my knees praying and not as passionate about it when i'm sitting and having coffee with someone else it takes me a lot more effort to be someone who thinks about god conversation partner in a coffee shop along with another person then i believe that god is engaged with me in a conversation when i bend go down on my knees and bend my head in prayer the gospel is becoming increasingly about me and it being primarily about us his body and then his world that's that's the lie we've come to believe and so we we are happy to believe in jesus die and go to heaven and so we pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name here i come well i know we don't kind of say those words out we say may your kingdom come but our lives are basically lived saying here i come There is an unfortunate and inevitable, inescapable, you could say, regress into apathy towards what's happening in the world. 
we are very very interested in what God can do for us We're not so much concerned as to what God is looking to do through us Come on. like Jesus' disciples we are quite happy to get him food so that he doesn't go hungry but we are not quite there to be able to grapple with the reality where he says my to do the will of the father and that's why i said it's probably to do with the gospel being misunderstood and therefore it gets misappropriated we tend to continue in bright widening this split between the sacred and the secular we struggle with understanding what it means to to hunger and thirst for righteousness and to be meek and peacemakers and a lot of these things which we will try to bring together as we tie these thoughts together and 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 so we we begin to see that what's more important to the christian by and large is how christ is relevant to them and not so much concerned as to how they as Christians will live relevant lives to the world around them. Christ is for my good, is very important to us, but how am I living for the good of the other is not so, so much a concern to us. So we move from the unfortunate regress to what I call <clears throat> the hopeful progress. I don't know if you realize this, when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he cautions us to not lose our saltiness. And so I've explored into what are some of the reasons why we could be losing our saltiness. But then when he spoke about us being the light of the world, there was hopeful progress that he speaks about. He says, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. In other words, what Jesus is doing is that he's inviting his followers, his disciples, to be intentional about charting a course in progress and moving forward. In other words, he's, he's laying for us a pathway. And so just as much as we looked at the, uh, the causes, uh, you know, the symptoms and the causes that underlies those, those symptoms and the consequences that followed, so too when we look at the hope, hopeful progress, when, when we're told that we are the light of the world and we are invited to let our light shine, we must grapple with the problems we have. We need to get a sense of the predicament we, we face. And as we do that, we need to embrace, learn to embrace the purpose, the life we are called to live. And what undergirds that is what I call growing in holy worldliness. I know that's, that sounds like, you know, a, a, a contradiction of terms. I mean, we, we separate the two, right? We are either holy or worldly. But I, I would like to suggest that part of the way forward is to nurture what I call holy worldliness. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you in a bit on that. So here are the three things that we need to do if we are to recover, hopefully, a pathway towards progress in engaging the world as God calls us to. And the first thing is to appreciate our predicament. Why must we, as followers of Jesus, live the way he wants us to live? Because if we don't, here's the problem. If we don't, then we will be no different from those who don't know and don't follow Jesus. The world can be you know, the way the world lives can be summarized in one word. Self-serving. Hyphenated nonetheless. And so we have to ask the question, why are people sacrificing themselves at the altar of self-indulgence? Granted, I'm not making this as an accusation. I'm only making this as an observation, which means there will be people across the spectrum who are generous, who are gracious. But what I'm saying is that the underlying reality, the undercurrent of all of the way humanity lives is a deep sense of self-indulgence. Something there 
in whatever we do has to have to do about me. So we normally live with the question which says, what is there in this for me? And I want you to think about how you choose to do whatever you do. Whether you ask this out loud or not is a different matter, but invariably you keep asking the question. I keep asking the question, why should I do this? Why should I get involved? What's there in this for me? And so if we come back to that question of why are people sacrificing themselves at the altar of self-indulgence, I think it has a lot to do with us and our sense of identity. In other words, it's a quest for identity. We do whatever we do because we believe it has to do for our good. No one is involved in anything that they don't think is for their sake. So it's a quest for not only their identity, who we are, but it's also a quest of value. What am I worth? And that's why we keep pressing on and doing things over and over and over again. I mean, if we find our identity and our value in in being appreciated at work, we work harder. If we find our, 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 our identity, our value, our security in, in the resources we have or, you know, the assets we build, we spend a lot more time in, in doing that. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. But then there are some clues which helps us appreciate our predicament, and that is this. No matter how much we accomplish or how much we acquire, somehow we keep wanting more. In other words, our heart is longing for satisfaction, but all we can do is pursue constant action. And that becomes a problem for us. Because at the end of the day, what we're looking for is that we're looking for a deep sense of being settled, satisfaction. And that's why we long for hope and we look for significance. So sure, we do all that we do, but our predicament is the hands that accomplish all of this and all that our hands accomplish is not sufficient to satisfy the heart that longs for, always longs for more than these. That's our predicament. And we need to appreciate that because it's not just the one who knows Jesus who struggles with it. Everybody struggles with it. The hands are inadequate to satisfy the heart. And that's everybody's problem. And so we who are called of God need to learn to embrace our purpose if we are to progress, chart a pathway, not just understand the problems, but chart a pathway moving forward. And, and that's why we need to embrace our purpose or our call. Very simply, if you step back, Jesus called us to follow him together. Now that, that word together is very important two ways to look at this. One is to look at what happens in the upper room as to what's set the stage for Jesus' last communal act of service, you could say, in the upper room. What happened before that and what followed after that. Before they went to the upper room, there was this constant bickering going on because James and John sent their mother to Jesus and said to Jesus, let's settle where my two sons are going to be positioned. One to your right, one to your left. So it was a quest for power and power play. That caused a lot of discord among the disciples because you read the scriptures and it makes it very plain that they were very, very unhappy when this word got out that James and John had sent their mother to to talk to Jesus about their position as followers of Jesus. They're very, very unhappy about it. Now, the upper room was not only rid with tension because Peter didn't want Jesus to, to wash his feet, but also Peter was looking at James and John sitting next to him. But Jesus washes all their feet. 
and he says this i am your lord and your master because that's what you've confessed and you're right that that's who i am and i am your lord and if i have washed your feet i want you to wash one another's feet what he was saying and i want you to think about this very very carefully the reason he washed peter's feet was because he told Peter, he gave Peter the, 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 the explanation. He said, the reason I'm washing your feet, Peter, is so that you can belong to me. And then he says to this bunch of people who have every reason to be upset and annoyed with one another, given all the events that led to this, this particular washing of the feet, he says to them, just as I have washed your feet, I want you to wash one another's feet, meaning very simply, unless we belong to one another, which is actually the, the new commandment he gives us, that you would love one another as he has loved us, unless we belong to one another, it is not possible to belong to him. Christians are called to be a community. And it's only in this community will we be able to show the world our true identity that it is not just about who Jesus is or what he does for us but it is about how we belong to one another so it's about being and belonging not merely about accomplishing or acquiring and that's how we embody truth you know when Jesus says as the father sent me I send you he was talking to his body the church and that's how we become bearers of hope that's how these instruments are set right that's how it will not be the blindfolded leading the blind it would be those who know their maker who have encountered their redeemer who is now helping the lost get home and that's why we celebrate our liberty. So how do we how do we embrace our purpose? Very simply, you just just a few things. I mean, if you want to write these down, you can write these these scriptures down and go back and refer to it. Paul, when he writes to the to the church in Thessalonica, says to them in chapter one, in in his first letter, he says to them, "I want you to turn from idols and serve." the living God and uh, that one word in between is very important he says turn from idols and he does not say I want you to turn from idols and turn to the living God that they've already done remember he's writing to the church but he says turn from idols and serve the living God it's important for understand for us to understand that turning to God is in is implicit in that is the invitation to serve the living God and to serve the living God we serve the world we live for their good and that's why when he writes to the church in Ephesus uh, Ephesians chapter 5 this time he says be very careful how you live especially how you live among this this Gentile world that's perishing live wisely he says make choices that reveal your true identity and make plain your ambition so you not only turn from idols and serve the living God, you, you live careful lives making wise choices. And it's not just Paul who has a deep burden for this. Peter would say this in his, in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, be intentional about living godly lives. Be intentional about living godly lives. In fact, in chapter 2, if you read through that passage you will find Peter is contrasting two different circles circle of death he talks about put away all malice and, and slander and hypocrisy and envy and so on and so forth that's a circle of death actually if you pay close attention to it he contrasts that with what happens to us as we come to Jesus the living stone rejected by men but approved by God that God takes us and builds us together into God's dwelling as a living space so we turn from idols to serve the living God we are careful to make wise choices but most importantly we are intentional about living 
godly lives and that is why I would say that we are called to grow in holy worldliness so let me just quickly make a change over here for you as you see this right there okay that is technology growing in holy worldliness that's what God's called us to we are intentional about being who Christ wants us to be in this world and so how do we do it one of my favorite passages in all of scripture is Matthew 5 to 11 specifically 5 through to 7 because in this whole space in 5 to 11 Jesus he begins this passage by t seeing how desperate people were he went up to the mountain his disciples came to him and in the hearing of all those who were gathered up around him he started by saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and then he ends in chapter 11 by saying come to me all who are weak and heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me and you will find rest for your souls so Jesus knows that we are weak and heavy laden and he tells us that that is blessed to be poor in spirit. And he sketches a paradigm for us, which, which I would say, it includes our disposition towards God and our responsibility towards the world. And I began with saying you are salt of the earth, you are light of the world, and that's where I will end, you know, this, this time as well. I'm going to kind of wrap this up in the next couple of minutes so we can have a time for interaction and questions. So here's what you would see over here when you read the Sermon on the Mount, at least what we have come to call the Beatitudes. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he says, blessed are those who moan. Blessed are those who meek and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want you to see how this all flows together. When you are poor in spirit and you recognize that, you mourn your spiritual poverty. And when you mourn your spiritual poverty, you recognize that the only way for you to live your life is for you to be helped. And when you are comforted, because he promises to comfort us when you mourn, you become meek. And as you in live life in that meekness, the only thing you realize that will satisfy you is no longer what you accomplish or acquire, but what he does. And so you start hungering and thirsting for righteousness and his promises you shall be filled this is what i call our disposition towards god we are humble before god we know our limitations and we are grateful for his provision and that's why peter would say humble yourself in the sight of the lord and in due time he will lift you up god resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble a disposition towards God and perfect humility but not only that as we are disposed towards God in, in humility as Christ himself demonstrates that in the washing of his disciples feet and he commands the disciples to wash one another's feet you can't do that without humility but here's the thing as we are disposed towards God in humility we are disposed towards our fellow human beings in perfect charity meaning we are merciful we are merciful to those around us because God is merciful towards us we we are pure in our motive towards them we are no longer here to figure out what they can do for us but we are actually here for them in a world that lives with the mantra what is there in this for me we start living with the ethos with the firm conviction that we are here for them as the father sent the son to us so the son is sending us to them and that's why we can be peacemakers even when we are persecuted for righteousness sake a disposition of humility towards god a disposition of graciousness and charity towards the other and i'm not talking about charity as merely giving arms i'm talking about charity in which you live your life for the good of the other 
that's what Jesus did. And what will be the consequence of this? What? See, that's that is holy worldliness. That is living in the world as Christ lived in the world without corruption or compromise. He did not become anything other than who he is. And he did not compromise why he lived. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he ended that saying, not my will, but yours be done. Into your hands I commit my spirit. I want you to realize there's a massive connection between the first few words we hear from Jesus and the last few words we hear from Jesus. The first few words we hear from Jesus where he talks about his own coming. He says, And God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him will be saved. His last few words was, Father, forgive for they do not know what they do. That's how the world through him was going to be reconciled to the Father and not be condemned because forgiveness was offered. There was no confusion in his identity, no compromise in the way he lived. Holy worldliness. And when we do that, the consequence of that is that we would leave a godly legacy we would actually be salt and light so we come back to where we began you are Jesus says the salt of the earth you are the light of the world make every effort to make sure that you do not lose your saltiness and at the same time be very careful that you don't lie your life is not hidden under a basket but it is set on a hill so that the world will know, will see that you are indeed what God wants you to be and therefore they can be what God wants them to be. So thank you so much for your time, your patience and for giving me a hearing. Thank you so much. Uh, would you like to close us in prayer? Definitely, my privilege. Come, let's pray together. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to show forth your incredible glory, treasures of eternal worth, as Paul would put it, in these fragile, broken, cracked jars of clay. Nothing else could explain why you would entrust to us the privilege of being salt and light in a city that set on a hill. And so we pray, Lord, as we continue to reflect on who you are, what you've done for us, why you've called us to yourself, and above all, how we are called to live in your grace and for your glory. We pray and ask that your Spirit would take us by the hand and continue to lead us and teach us to walk in step with him. And so I thank you for this privilege. I thank you for these incredible conversations that we could have today. May you continue to speak to us. May you continue to encourage us. And may you continue to help us, even the even as the days are so difficult, especially with the pandemic, making it so difficult and inconvenient. We pray your grace would be sufficient for us and your strength would be made perfect in our weakness. So thank you for this time and dismiss us with your blessing. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much.